Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Court Rutnowski. I'm the chairman of the Greater Education Council of Connecticut. And this is um, part of an ongoing series where we get into various issues that affect the state and the nation. And uh, today we are um, interviewing Bob McGuffey, who is running for Congress and is also the author of The Seventh Crisis. Um, why Millennials Must Reestablish Ordered Liberty. The, um, I just want to start out by saying that I've read a lot of books. I know good books and I know bad books. And I can tell you this is not a good book. This is a great book, okay? I have known Bob for, what should I say, 14 years? More or less. More or less. And the, the sense of how he has um, condensed essentially decades, along with his co-author, Anthony Stark, decades of argument, debate, research, and thinking into this, which follows a very clear um, path of development in terms of the ideas that animate this nation, um, is, is something that you must read for yourself and enjoy. So the um, basic idea, and maybe you can clarify this for me, is that there's a, a, this trend or this struggle, okay, between liberal and conservative views, which we put it that way, this is more complicated. And uh, along the way, uh, there's been this, um, what's, uh, what am I looking for here? This um, growing sense of crisis, and it's based upon a cycle of history model that Bob will talk about. And the feeling is that we're at the uh, critical cusp of uh, one of these uh, turning points in history. He wants to blame this generation for that, and he might be right. But then he turns to another generation, the millennials, and suggests that they are the ones that are going to have to fix this mess. Okay? But the, I think the other point to keep in mind is certainly going to be a part of what we're talking about here is that this, this realization is, uh, is coupled with the uh, sense that more and more people see what our government is doing, understand it more deeply, and at some point we want to believe that this reaches a critical mass where the concept of ordered liberty will find its home in our nation. So what do you think, Bob? Well, that's, that's an assessment of, of where we're, we are now. The book is called The Seventh Crisis, and it, t it, it uh, plays off a book that was written in 1997 by two demographers and historians called The Fourth Turning. And in The Fourth Turning, uh, they had been looking at history and the people that make history for a long time. And they're looking at the generations and how the generations are formed and what their value sets are and how they act out when they, when they come to power and leadership in the culture. And um, after, a, after a lot of research going back 500 years in, hist in Anglo-American history, mm -hmm. they realized that there's a cyclical pattern. Um, there's four phases that, that history continues to go through and it's driven by the generations, and it's driven by the environment within which the generations rise, are born and then mm -hmm. rise to leadership. And they go back to the time of Columbus, and they, and, they, and they look at, and they basically came up with seven cycles from the Glorious Revolution, the War of the Roses, the Armada, the American Revolution, the Civil War, and the... Um, uh, Depression in World War II in, in, this, uh, in the past century, in the 20th century. And they noticed that uh, there were phases uh, that, that, that each cycle went through, four mm -hmm. phases. So if, if you come out of a crisis, there's a, a resolution, there's an agreement in the society on how our, we're going to live, our mores and... Uh, our, 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 it's a return to a foundation, maybe a new foundation after the crisis. But there's a high, and everything runs well. And so to get the people today to understand what that means is think of the 1950s going into the 60s. After World War II, we had won the Great War. The Depression was gone. Mm -hmm. There was a renewal, a high, an agreement. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, those of us that were kids then remember that, how well everything ran. And what happens is uh, they're, 
there's a new generation that grows up within that, and, and, and they get new ideas, and they challenge the ex existing order with new ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, think the 1960s, because that's all we had. <laughs> By the late 1960s, all you had was rebellion, new ideas, the protests, the campus stuff, all of that. And, and they call that an awakening. And what happens is that the youth will drive it as they m move into adulthood. And, and much of what the ideas they, they push get picked up by the older generation, get embedded in the social mores of the day, and kind of become the new gears moving society along. Mm -hmm. And it's not always good. Think the 1970s. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the awakening. So they adopt many of the new ideas. And what happens? The gears grind. And so each of these phases are 20, 25 years. Then the gears grind, and it doesn't work right because mm -hmm. the foundational values were the best. And then you have a breakdown and what they call the unraveling, where mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. And that was like the 80s into the 90s mm -hmm. in our country. There was an unraveling. It, it, just, it was more conflict, and, and it just didn't feel right anymore, mm -hmm. even though in some respects, such as the economy, was, was good then. But what it inevitably will do, and these guys wrote this in 1997, they forecast we're going to go into another crisis because the forces that get unleashed are in conflict with, with those that, that say, wait a second, there's foundational values here that are in conflict. And they forecast in 97 that somewhere in the, in mid, the mid next decade, there would be a, um, a new crisis would emerge. Mm -hmm. And they actually pointed to the debt. They saw what was happening with, with the debt and the borrowing. Because if you go back to the Roman Republic and others, there's always that debt thing. There's always the devaluation mm -hmm. of the money. The government wants to do everything it wants to do, whether it can afford it or not. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things. So what they call 9-11 comes around. They call that a precursor event. Um, and, and then you, you, you get back to business again. And then finally, the crisis emerges, and that's the 08 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're reading the book, The Fourth Turning, in, in 2017. I'm reading this book, and uh, they, you know, the book is in 97. They just say it's going to come. I said, this is what happened. Because um, you know, I was a Tea Party leader in mm -hmm. 09, 10, 11, 12. And that's a main reason we came out was to say, hold up. We, we can't run the country like this, particularly, particularly the the economic side of it. And I said to my co-author, Tony, um, you know, we had known each other for decades. I said, look at this thing. This is exactly where we are. We're, we're in the seventh crisis. So we wrote an essay and then we turned it in, in, into a book. And what we do in the book is, is we try to de delineate the lines of this, this crisis. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's the, um, you know, that's the genesis of it. Okay. So the, I guess I have a bunch of questions, but in you're laying this out, the idea is that the political trajectory and the economic trajectory um, for these phases are about the same. Well, and it, it becomes curious, right? Because the political part, as is argued here, is how those in power continue to seek more power, right? And while they're seeking more power, they continue to expand spending and push our economy ever closer to crisis. Yeah, whether intentionally or not. Some, for some, it's intentional, I think. But um, uh, well, what happens, you know, when Franklin was asked, you know, a republic, if you can keep it. Mm -hmm. Republics, if you look at history, they run about 250 years. You know, and the cynical view is once the population realizes they can vote benefits from the, from the mm -hmm. national right. treasury, sure. you know, it's you're over. toast, you know. And so, yeah. I, I mean, pe people said this to me in the late 60s when I was a, a teenager that, you know, the smart people at that time, they said, we're going the way of Rome, you know. Mm -hmm. And the next, in the late 60s, the first time I heard it was, the next great power is going to be China, you know. And it was really driven by demographics, certainly not their capabilities well, in the late actually, 60s. Actually, there was a period in the 60s where we were looking at the Soviet Union as, um, you know, era. Well, parent. that was, yeah. They, but, well, yeah. But mm -hmm. they had, they, there was some inherent 
problems in them. But back to your question about the political and the economic, they, they go hand in hand. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, you get called a, a conspiracy theorist or something. I, I, I mean, that's just a, you know, that's just adult language for saying dog poop on you. I mean, oh, no. <laughs> it's yeah. just it, conspiracy theorists. So I call you a, 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 co a coincidence conspiracist. You oh, know, okay. Right. I mean, it's silliness, but it's a, it's a, it's a very smartly used term that goes back to the time of Kennedy's assassination, where they disparage anybody that's looking under the covers, basically. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at what's going on behind the scenes, they'll immediately marginalize you with, 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 with that term. But a, a guy named uh, Carol Quigley in the, in the late 60s wrote a book called Tragedy and Hope, mm -hmm. and um, he spilled the beans. He was in the room, and he spilled the beans on what goes on uh, you know, behind the scenes. And, and the publishers, they got... The, the politicos got the publishers to kill the book then. It finally came out, you know, 10, 15 years later. But it was, it was killed in the crib in the late 60s because mm -hmm. he actually told the story. And I just say to people, do you think that men of great power and wealth do not want to order things for their advantage? Really, mm -hmm. you don't think that. Right. I mean, the question is to what degree it's going on and, and what's happening. And... Um, it all fits in, you know, unfortunately, uh, there was a, there, there was really a cancer that was injected into this country in the mid-20th century from Frankfurt, Germany, and the Marxist school and all mm -hmm. that. Yep. And, and, and um, unfortunately, they got their toehold first in the yeah, universities. Well, you see it bearing fruit now. Yeah, you sure, you, you sure do. So there's a, you know, there, there's a natural man's uh, desire to control situations, certainly control finances and money. And then you put the subversive uh, ideology in, into the bloodstream, which, mm -hmm. which they did very effectively, so that the new people coming up under the old leaders have this, you know, anti-American, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, collectivist mentality. It's a nasty brew. And yeah. the great Ronald Reagan, you know, I, I thought he vanquished them, but, uh, you know, he did not. But he, yeah. he vanquished them for the time being. He was managed to emerge and succeed and get elected when mm -hmm. they, they did everything they could to hold him back and gave us a, a, a final burst of revival, which was extinguished by the end of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. and, and then the, it the, the elements just continued to grow and fester, and, and we would contend until Barack Obama came along. So Barack Obama, you know, was at the time when, uh, and you had McCain, they were running for president at the time, and that's when um, TARP happened. Yep. Right? So, yes, this was a critical, uh, but I have to wonder, you know, whenever you see events like this. Well, it was when the system trying to save itself. Well, yes, they were. That's what, that's what they did. But they saved themselves but individually. It was, <laughs> but it was also the question, why now? You know? Well, because, I mean, they... Well, it froze up on them. You know, the money printing machine, you know, froze yeah. up. They, you know, because the politi... The politi look, you have a free market. The free market works. It's going it's, it, it, it's to get frothy and it's going to crash and have to re-found mm -hmm. re, uh, itself. But when you interfere... And Fannie and Freddie were interfering while they were, they were, you know, basically backing mortgages for people that couldn't afford to pay them. Yeah, well, those were created, weren't those created back in the 70s? Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Yeah, Virginia but they, they went on steroids, you know, by the progressives, uh, you know, during the Bush's administration, coming out of Clinton's administration. And what, what they did, they, they created a great credit crisis. Mm -hmm. then, then, they cre then they created the credit default swaps mm -hmm. for, uh, for backing up their, their sure. bad loans. Right. You know? and, and so they had the institutions like AIG issuing these things. And it wasn't just the swaps, it was the leverage. Well, the whole thing was over leveraged, and people finally couldn't couldn't pay anymore. Peter Schiff predicted it. He mm -hmm. looked at the real numbers, the the you know the press, the the cable the ca cable press, the, the financial uh, channel, CNBC, Fox News, and the rest. You know, they they cover the froth on top. People like a Peter Schiff or a David Stockman will look under mm -hmm. what's going on un, un, underneath, and they right. they saw that thing ready to blow, as it is again now. Debt is always, you know, the But I, I'm the willing problem. to bet that they would never have predicted 
that we would see the amount of, am I using the right term here, federal debt that we see now? Well, no. Uh, Was it they 33 knew, trillion now? Yeah, it's 33 trillion now. That's in, federal debt. Yeah, I mean, rough, when, when Bush came in in 2000, it was $5 trillion. When mm -hmm. he left, it was 9 to $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. And then when Obama left, he doubled it again. So it was doubled twice. But see, what happened was you know, Ben Bernanke, uh, the fixer, and, and, and uh, Timothy Geithner, mm -hmm. uh, th they came in and they knew that you could, you could if, if you had the nerve to blow all this new money over the, over the corpses of mm -hmm. the economy, yeah. you could stave off depression and, and severe recession, whatever it would have been, to reset the economy. So now you have all this dead enterprises, and they come in and the Fed blows new money across it, and everybody's trading the new money. Mm -hmm. But what do you got underneath it? You have this, this carcass of an economy. And that's why you don't have the growth. So, you know, well, they, went, they went into Bush. Most people don't realize. Well, they keep <coughs> reporting growth. I mean, yeah. you're suggesting that it's sort of like fake growth somehow. Well, um, it, it largely is, and they, can, and they never seem to get over, over 2%. But what happened was they, the, the, the whole market was freezing up, the credit markets, yeah. and, and the banks went into Bush, and they, and, and they said in 48 hours we'll be unable to fund the ATMs. Most Americans don't know that. Mm -hmm. That will get their attention. They, they, mm -hmm. You know, Americans are hard to get their attention. But if they put the card in, they get nothing. They say, ah, what the heck's going on here? Yeah. And that's going to happen again. We've actually had a couple of small bank runs. Remember sure. what, well, there was yeah. one in St. Louis a few yeah. years ago, for example? Yeah. So they, they, they passed the legislation so that he could print all this money. Mm -hmm. So they patched it. And then, you know, Obama lev leveraged the situation, got elected, and then he never put it. A, a lid on it. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time, they, they probably weren't going to let the banks get away without paying it back, but they, they paid it back by yeah. 2013. Okay. I want to pick something out of the book here that, um, you know, I believe any book that is written um, and any article has what I'll call the buried lead. You mean you may have your main point, yeah. but the real zinger is buried somewhere in the book. <laughs> And see, I, there was see one. What you think the zinger is in there? I, well, I'm, I may be changing my mind. I know this is going to sound weird, but here we go. So, if I may, just a, a short passage from his book. Um, so, this is going back to uh, the time of the Civil War or thereabouts. The party, so here you're talking about the Whigs, I think, right? Uh, the party generally split along sectional lines as the Civil War drew close, closer until many of the northern Whigs, who hated those Whigs that sought conciliation with the South, in the name of good business, formed a new party, the Republican Party, in 1854, consisting of northern Whig businessmen, abolitionists, and other reformed, reform-minded modernizers. Now, you went on to talk about this and establish that there was this, in, almost from day one, right? You had this internal split between those who are more, shall we say, business-oriented and those who are more principle-oriented. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yep. Well, that, those are the forces are the those So this are forces battle has been going on since at least, at least I yeah, mean, well, there, 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 there are precursors to this in the book. But yes, I mean, right there, you kind of go, whoa, this, well, is, uh, this is the setup. You, right. And so, the, the, you know, they, the, the many people in the last 20 years have said the Republican Party could go the way of the Whigs if they don't go back to the, the, their foundational principles. At least their foundational principles mm -hmm. since Taft. Mm -hmm. You know, prior to that, you know, the, they, they, were, they were a big business combine going right, right, right through the last half of the century. And then you had Teddy Roosevelt as a progressive. And, uh, he, you know, TR is the reason for a lot of these problems. I mean, they may have come about anyway. Yes, that's a whole he ran, other story. You know, he ran oh, as a third, he, yeah, he ran oh, as a third party and, and he put in, uh, yeah, why we he put in Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson. And, and Woodrow Wilson quickly gave us the Federal Reserve and the personal federal income tax <laughs> and the direct election well, of senators. Yeah, well, there's a, a, related to this, I mean, I'm throwing in my two bits here. Um, I'm trying to remember the term. It involved, um, how should I say this, little changes in the law that served the purpose of discouraging civic participation by individuals. And I wish I could remember the term, but it turns out that this term was in use in the uh, 1900s, early 1900s, thereabouts. 
So one of the big fans, and believe it or not, you know, in the early stages of the Russian Revolution, you still had Russians able to speak up and push back against the government. Lenin was not a happy camper. So he was looking for a concept here to reduce public participation. Yeah. We should remember it. Well, Mao did the same thing. Yes, but you want to know who the other big fan of this concept was? Teddy Roosevelt. So good old Teddy and Lenin were thinking along the yeah. same lines. Yeah, well. That's shocking. That's heresy. Yeah, that's, you that's know? not good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, but no, it's, you know, you're talking here about how Teddy, the dark side of Teddy Roosevelt, right? Yep. And um, see, I'll just, I'm going to quote you again here. Uh, Roosevelt was the advocate of what might be called the omnicompetent state, you know, which sounds a lot like Wilson, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would guarantee new social benefits to the American people, but would also make new demands for sacrifice that would, to, that would impinge on traditional American concerns for their individual liberties. It's so strange, you know, because he rejected this image of rugged individualism, yet he was ready to take people's rights away. Yeah, well, that's progressivism, and that's him, you know. But, I mean, who knew? You, yeah. Yeah, who knew? If he would have got in again, I don't know. I, I don't know what he would have done. It's uh, you know, you, you well, really got to peel peel it back on uh, on that. I think he, he he would not have done what Wilson did. Yeah. But you know, J.P. Morgan got tired of saving the economy from the outside, so they cooked up the Federal Reserve, which mm -hmm. is a quasi governmental entity, mm -hmm. and you know, and and then the well, federal income personal I think it was income a money tax cartel. Yeah. Well, that's what it is, certainly. Yeah. And, and it's, it's been destructive ever since. You know, the idea, I took economics, yeah, yeah, and I yeah. remember when I first got exposed to what the Fed really was, and I, I thought there was a place for something like that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's totally out of control. And the way they, they, they rig the system, the way you're supposed to increase the money supply is, is, is really through the interest rates and the buying and selling on the, on the, the open market committee. That's where the money mm -hmm. supply would be traditionally get increased but instead they just they go downstairs and flick a switch and suddenly the the uh, participating banks in the Federal Reserve have have reserve increases yes and they serve that's no why Ron Paul wanted to wanted to audit the Fed and yes rah, they oh. strangled that one along the way there was Actually, some good push for wait, that wait, not, there was one audit I it was July of uh, what do I want to say 2012 or something I mean yeah and it was embarrassing. Yeah, there was okay. something initial. It was embarrassing. And then there they, was a they testimony. They always smother those things. There's a testimony where this uh, auditor, or what do you call them? Um, darn it. What's the term? Internal investigators is a term for them. I'm so inspector them. generals. Yes, inspector yeah. generals. So they have their inspector generals in the Fed. And in testimony, she sat there, whatever the amount of, say $20 billion. I, I don't know where it went. I can't account yeah. for it. Yeah. What? Oh, there's, what? The numbers are bigger than that. Yes, I'm just there's, picking on. I know there's people. It's just. Uh, yeah, uh, it, 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 it's an unorderable. It's a black box. The Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and and they've they've taken more and more risks since mm -hmm. '08 in what mm -hmm. they do and how they do it. And right now, in the repo, the overnight repo market mm -hmm. still has a lot of funds in it, and and they're drawing those 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 funds to buy bonds off the open market to keep the to keep the bond prices I thought the repo market keep, was to keep help the, the bond prices up and the interest rates down the the key to this whole thing the the fuse is the interest rates mm -hmm. because yeah. the tea party came out in 2009 when it was 9 trillion in debt and we and and the interest rates were artificially low then right they were 2 or 3% they had been knocked down mm -hmm. because of the the, the financial crisis, and, and if you think of the budget, the federal budget as a pie with the wedges, you know, okay, now the interest sure. rate wedge is this big, but if, if the interest rates go up, the interest on the debt's going to start doing that, sure. and it's going to eat the other, it's okay. going to eat I mean, the whole thing up, right? And historically, we've had That's what drove us in the streets. We could do math. Yeah. Of course, we were disparaged and all the rest of it, and all kinds of peripheral signs and all the nonsense, mm -hmm. but the reason we came out was we didn't want the banks bailed out by Bush, and then, we, and, then, and then Obama comes in and he does a trillion dollar omnibus bill or some, this uh, porculus bill we call it, it was a stimulus sure, I bill, remember. totally unnecessary in February of 2009, 
And by the end of the month, the Tea Party is born because we're out on the streets going, we know what, what's going on here, and it cannot be financed. Yeah, don't forget Centilli. Yeah, Centilli gave it a name. Yes. He gave it a name. What, what, how the Tea Party came, for those that don't know, is he did that rant. Yes, and, I remember and that And Jenny rant. Beth Martin and Mark Meckler and others were Ron Paul guys, and they still had their circle going online. They immediately grabbed the name. I always said to Tony, I wish I would have grabbed that name. We yeah. formed Right Principles a right. Months, couple months before. They grabbed the name and they became the Tea Party, and then they raised funds on that and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And she's still around. Yeah, and she's still around. But, you know, sitting on $25 million or something but uh, in, in donations from people. Yeah. But what we saw was that this debt cannot be financed at higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. And so we, we figured during the teens, the, the interest rates would move up, and, 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 and there was a crisis right there. Mm -hmm. Obama, would, would, Obama and the Democrats in Congress, leading the Congress, would not cut spending. They, and so mm -hmm. then you had the fights um, uh, when, when, we, when the Republicans took over the uh, House in 2010. Mm -hmm. Then you started getting these debt ceiling fights because yep. we were telling them what they had to do. You know, and, and which is what we're facing again now. And they, you know, you you got the um, uh, there there was a oh, the name of it uh, austerity. There was an austerity thing passed, and they put a car wash on a little. You know, Obama hated it, mm -hmm. and everybody cut the fence too, and they 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 went along with it. And we're trying to get control, but we you couldn't convince the average American how dire this this is. Mm -hmm. They think it's all somewhere else. But so there's there's. At $33 trillion of debt, mm -hmm. public debt, folks, that's, that's um, about $280,000 per household in the United States. Wait, say that again? Of debt. $280,000. Debt per person. No, per household. Per, per household. household. But then what was the, the percentage? The th well, it's, it's $33 trillion. If you divide it through the households, okay. you'll come up with 287 yeah, per yeah. household. You know, so... That's what we're that's what we're facing, and okay. and at that time it was about a hundred hundred and forty hundred less. It was a hundred and twenty or something mm -hmm. thousand Still dollars. High. Yeah, um, and people think, well, I'm not going to have to pay that. Well, when your dollar bill becomes a quarter or a dime, you will have paid. You're paying now. The groceries are probably. 50% more than they were a couple of years ago. The things you need, they always say inflation is low. Not in health care, which you got to have. Not in groceries, not in mortgages, right? Mm -hmm. not, not in or tuition or, or anything yeah. that matters. Energy, it's through the roof. And um, I mean, it's a, it's a cruel tax. It's a tax the middle class pays because the upper class, they, they'll pay but it doesn't change their lifestyle. It absolutely throws the rest of us in, into, into disarray. And, and we have the result of it all now. Right. The, the inflation was kept under control. And, it, and with the pandemic, it's been unleashed. It's not getting put back mm -hmm. in the bottle. And that's what this fight for the speaker is about mm -hmm. today. This is 14 years in the making. And we're saying you, it's not a matter of opinions. That's what they have to do. They have to address this debt. There's not a Democrat out there that wants to address it, and only about half the Republicans do. Right. Uh, no, the, as, as noted, we're seeing it play out that there is a disgusting number of so-called Republicans who have no problem um, spending this country into oblivion. Okay. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's really tragic. It's, it's hard to believe, you know, that, that they, they put their own personal interests ahead yeah. of. So you know, if you, if you put your own personal interests ahead of some shaving of the edges of the national situation, you know, that's one thing. They got to know it's all on the line, and these guys are subverting it. Well, and it, that, it's inexcusable. Well, I'm going to throw in a quick comment and then jump to the next obvious thing by your points. Historically, the nation has handled um, a debt level of about 12 to 15 percent of the total budget. Of the GDP. Yeah, 12 to 15. That, that oh, you mean a, well, to wait. pay off the debt. Oh, of, the, you, of the U.S. budget, yes. Yes, so right around there. Less. But, uh, but it's like eight. Under Bush, it, it was around 12 well, at some yeah, point. Yeah, it, it got but, jacked a bit. <clears throat> so the, the sense is that there's a, a, a sort of an upper limit. Um, now we're looking at hitting and tra possibly transcending that limit. As Steve Bannon said, 
federal government has no intention of paying back a single nickel of the principal no. on that $33 trillion. It's, it's just it's no. too big. It's no. too big. No, no, they never talk about it. Yeah, so the, all of this now, it is, it is so odd to me <clears throat> that at this point in history, okay, when we're reaching a financial state that defies understanding, now all of a sudden we're going to popularize, wait for it, modern <laughs> monetary theory, yeah. MMT. Yep. And the father of it happens to live not, not too far from here. Okay. Warren Mosler. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shame on Hamden, him. A Hamden area or something. I, it just... Well, that's a total... How does that even pass muster with It people? doesn't. It doesn't. It's eyewash. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they're practicing. But they had to give a, 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 a logical name. People like Krugman were being pushed. You know, you got to have a... You got to have a name for, that yeah. justifies printing money out of thin air. So they call it MMT. And, so how you do know, they... We take it on in the, in the <clears> book. But it... Tony wanted to take it on. I didn't even. I didn't want to do anything more than mention it. But he I wanted see. to dissect it a bit because he's not a finance guy. I am. I say this. This is like just cartoon. You know, it's okay. a cartoon theory. But they use it. They talk about well, it. Well, they, they talk about it. it. Yeah, they, they do talk about it. But um, you know, we got to a surplus. New, New Gingrich got Clinton. The, the good thing about Clinton was. You, you, you know, he wasn't really an ideologue, and he whatever he did, he wanted he wanted to do something that was that you could get credit for, and he could take it. Sure. So <laughs> the Republicans came along and said, "Get control of this budget," and and, and he goes, "Well, as long as I can take credit for it, you know." So amazingly, they got to a surplus for a couple of years, but they never paid any debt down with it. They just let it build up, and they handed it to Bush, yeah, who immediately the spent the whole damn thing on on the uh, drug plan mm -hmm. to keep Teddy Kennedy happy. And Teddy yeah. Kennedy was happy for about 24 hours, and then he right. went back to throwing harpoons at him. You, you can't mm -hmm. sate the left. Mm -hmm. Reagan, no, Reagan knew that. He, 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 he did decide in some things to do it, but in others he, mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't. But, but that's what Bush, Bush thought you could sate them. Well, they sated him for a week. They all got together, and they said, yeah, we're going to have a Medicare drug plan. Mm -hmm. you know, and then tick, 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 suddenly we're in Iraq. And, and a massive deficits being run, all right. and all yeah. the money printing, the surplus was history. So I want to deal with what might be a contradiction in all of this that I'm still not squaring in my own mind. On the one hand, by referring to these cycles of history, you're describing something that is somehow organic. You know, the, the forces at play that are uh, in conflict with each other almost like on a Ouija board, just seem to keep working out to this res coming to a crisis, resolution, these forces keep fighting, on and on. So there's this organic aspect to it. Yet, here we are also talking about the fact that there are quite a few people who have been planning on doing this for a long time. So how do you square planning for what would be upwards of 100 years now to destroy this country through these means, as expressed in these political and economic conflicts we've been discussing, against the concept of something that's supposed to be organic. Yeah, well, that's the danger in <clears throat> this in this one because you have an ideology at play in the in the bloodstream that wants to exploit mm -hmm. the crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, they've helped create it and they want to exploit it, and that's the the danger. And th yeah. this one, this is going to get, this is going to resolve. Anybody that thinks that this is just turbulent times and mm -hmm. we're going to paddle through this, no. Mm -hmm. There's going to be a fundamental change here. And, mm -hmm. and uh, because so many forces, the technology forces alone, mm -hmm. it, 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 you, you, digital currency, they want to do a central bank digital currency, a Fed sure. coin or something. Yeah. <laughs> you look at the technology, you, you, can't, you can't go a lot of places now without a ticket on your phone or whatever it is. Uh, this is all coming together to control the population. And mm -hmm. that, that's what it's about for the leadership class to control the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, this is the worst element. You know, we yeah, talk about I mean, you know, hold on, you know, use cash, you know, because, um, you know, the, if you look over in the China, in Chinese with the social credit scores, uh, 
that's that they'd love to do that. You listen. Well, you, there you, was actually a TikTok. You listen to Schwab and the, yeah, the World yeah. Economic Forum. It's all it's all part of the whatever you want to call it. Why do we have to be controlled by our government? We hire these people to administer the government on our behalf. Then they unionize against us. They, everything they got to write laws for everything, including your toaster. You yes. know, I mean, you know. So, so now they can't have a gas stove and a water heater. We got to control that too. They which could, the EU was controlled the toasters. There was seventy five regulations on toasters in Great Britain. That's one of the things that got the Brexit guys 75. to go. Yeah, there was seventy five regulators wow. on. It. I, oh. I mean, there's no thing they don't want to control, and it's human nature, which plays back into the book because mm -hmm. the book looks at human nature <clears throat> and the generations which come up under certain circumstances will will grow up and react in a similar way, mm -hmm. even two or three hundred years apart. Mm -hmm. Because human nature is, is the same. Man is a self-interested animal. Mm -hmm. I don't give up, get up every day to make sure things are going well in your house over there. I got enough in well, my own. over sometimes. Yeah, right. Feed the you dogs. Know, but they try to tell us that everybody, you know, for each according to ability, each according to his needs. It doesn't, man doesn't function like that. Mm -hmm. he, he, man will sit back like they did in the Soviet Union. They'll do nothing, you know, wait mm -hmm. for somebody else to do it. What capitalism does is it channels your urges to, to better yourself mm -hmm. and to make yourself wealthy, and it forces you to do, you'll only get wealthy if you create something that benefits yes. somebody else. Now, what was that gentleman's name? Adam Smith. That's or, right. That's right. Adam Smith organized it, you know, and the, you know the, you know, the, the Milton Friedman was the popular proponent of it, but mm -hmm. you know the old invisible hand. But they don't say it enough. Mm -hmm. They make like capitalism is exploitation. Well, if if I want to build and 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 create something that nobody wants, I'll quickly be out of business. I will not become wealthy. So you may resent my wealth in the end mm -hmm. and think I got too much or whatever, and you can have that discussion. But I only can get wealthy if I'm doing something to better your life, mm -hmm. period. Because if I make the product and nobody buys it, I'm out of business. And, th and that free market is mm -hmm. what needs to thrive. That's how this country went in 156 years, went, went from, mm -hmm. from, being, from its birth to being the most powerful nation sure. undisputed on the right. planet. Nothing had ever been done like that Yeah, before. so coming back to the modern day again, one of the, yes, the fault lines of engagement, that chapter. Um, you know, one of the parts of the fault line is the fact that we have this uh, double standard for justice in America. Oof. Big okay. Time. Yep. So the I'm trying to bump together two things here. Um, so you double standard that helps to protect those in power. Okay. So they're abusing our system of justice for their purposes, and how that creates an inherent tension in the society. How long can you get away with that, you know, before people begin to really rise up? Now, we're seeing another expression of this, right? I mean, there's a connection here I haven't quite formed in my head yet, but what I'm getting out of the no bail laws, okay? So you have so many examples in New York City, for example, of people who have committed multiple crimes, they get arrested, they're back out on the street. They do it again. There was one case of some guy who robbed a bank. I don't know. It was an unbelievable number of times until finally said, you know what, we can't let him out. So this, um, the same thinking here, we're on the one hand, yes, okay, this is the quintessential expression of compassionate liberalism. The poor guy, he's been disadvantaged in life, so really we shouldn't impose bail on him yet he is of a criminal nature. Then at the same time, we have a judicial system that says, well, if you're of a certain point of view, you're gonna get screwed, yeah. and if you're not, you won't. Well, you're, you, you, you're touching on an interesting one with the no bail. So, like, if you had the two-tier justice system where the, the, the ruling class was protecting themselves in the judicial system, mm -hmm. they, they'd probably, they would probably put away, they, they wouldn't stand for those common criminals who are committing, you know, robberies and violent stuff on the streets, they'd probably put them away. It's the subversives that are in the system that, mm -hmm. who want to take this down. Mm -hmm. 
that are leaving that out there. Because if you look at history, the only way to, to fundamentally change something as strong as the Republic of the United States of America is you've got to take it down. You can't, you can't move this powerful country where you want it to go. You've got to knock it down and rebuild. And part of the knocking down is certainly is what's going on in, in the cities. Right. You know, and, and so that's the subversive Marxists at work in the same corrupt milieu that the mm-hmm. powerful politicos and, and money interests mm-hmm. who just want to skewer the game for themselves. Now, now this, you've got this corrosive part. And so, you, 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 so you've, there's, you've there, got chaos in the cities now. You've got, you know, it, it's awful. New York, it's a shame, you know, after it was all straightened out. Right. So the, um, now uh, I'm going to shift a little bit. What we see here with this attempt to bring down the system, right, the constant push to introduce yet another law, another proposal, another program, create another crisis, it's, and we can say, yes, they want to bring the system down, yes, they want to create chaos, yes, they want to assume total control, but even then they won't be satisfied. Yeah, well, never there is some insatiable <laughs> quality, at least from what I see, to this uh, called liberal agenda or program that's informed by communist thinking, where it's they're just no. well, it, it, hey, look, you, you 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 just bring down a, a a great country, and God knows what's what could be on the other side of it if we let if we let it happen. Let me give you a example here. I mean, but, if you think in terms, right, so we started to talk about no bail, yeah. okay? So in other words, you're creating the conditions where there's more crime in society. At the same time, we'll say it, we're trying to take away your Second Amendment rights. We're trying to interfere with your ability to defend yourself under any circumstance. Already in California now, you know what they're trying to regulate now? Knives. Okay? So any concept of you being able to defend yourself, they don't want it. Okay? Yeah. So what kind of a society is that? Well... The, the Marxists are happy with it because they they need to knock it all down. They want to listen. They want to build an authoritarian society. Okay, so what does they, this authoritarian society suddenly look like? Serfdom. Now it's okay. Serfdom. Serfdom, where exactly. where the average people serve the state, and, right. and and that's it. And they figure there's enough that can be produced for themselves, that the rest of us are just you know cogs in the machine. The key to this country is 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 the is is the rel- relatively robust. Uh, a prosperous middle class because mm-hmm. you know, all the people will continue to take part. They, be, they, de- they derive mm-hmm. a prosperous lifestyle. They'll abide by the laws yes. and all the rest of it. And yeah. you take that out, you, oh. you always end up with a ruling elite and, and then an underclass. Right. And, and, and that's it. And once that happens, um, th- there's yes. no hope for the average. For you, average people, right? And you that's, brought up that's this, where they're heading this thing okay, too. Yeah, here it is. You there yeah, on this point? You made it's a one-liner. Uh, patriotism is God and country. Nationalism is blood and soil. Yeah, yeah. Well, you want to add to that? Do I want to add to that? Well, uh, I mean, you got to believe. You got to believe in your country and stand up for your country. But to draw <laughs> this distinction between, I mean, yes, there is a difference between patriotism and nationalism. And what you're suggesting well, here you is could, a lot you, of people don't understand it. You could, well, you put you you put them. Listen, nationalism is a term that's been disparaged, you know, mm-hmm. in the in the second half of the 20th century. Yes, as we yeah. know. And 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 that disparagement is 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 all part. The left the left is always in the media. You know, sending this stuff out. Yeah, and, they always come up under the you next know, phrase. The, like, you know, it's an, it's right. another topic, but. You, 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 you know, um, uh, uh, fascism is on the left side of this, the political spectrum, uh, folks. It's not on. It's not on the right side. The, right, well, the yeah. lefties, the lefties who hated the fascists, <clears throat> put it over there, and they use nationalism to tie it over there. Right, well, it's collectivism, where all of these authoritarian and totalitarian systems are on the left side of right. the Well, spectrum. so here's, if I may, looking at the camera, folks, this is my 25 cent lecture on this very topic. All political philosophies, all political ideologies, all arguments over whether it's fascism, socialism, communism, democracy, capitalism, whatever, comes down to one very simple point. 
the individual versus the group. The group can be the tribe, the family, the clan, the city, the nation. Who will have more power? Okay. So when we're talking about fascism, you're talking about state control. Socialism, state control. And as Bob is pointing out, when you have um, people creating confusion by suggesting that fascism is somehow a right-wing concept, when it is a state control concept, which is not right-wing at all, just saying. Anyway, back to our regular programs. <laughs> That's okay. about it. You yeah. know, we, so you know, the we've been saying, Tony and I have been saying that for decades. People look at you like you have two heads if you mm -hmm. understand what's going on. The only difference between the fascism and the communism is the communism, they, they, they believe that the state should take con control and own the means of production. Mm -hmm. The fascists are smarter. They said, let, let, let the individuals continue to run it and make their profits. They'll just do our bidding, pay the tribute to us. Yeah, it's and, called government regulation. Yeah, you know, and, it's right. intimid and then it has its whole world of intimidation and everything else and all their totalitarian uh, dictatorships. But now they've got people running the businesses who have an incentive to make the business efficient and deliver goods that, that people mm -hmm. want ten times better than, than the, the communist model, you know. That, that's, a, that's a loser. Mm -hmm. uh, fascism is the dangerous one, you know, because, you know, we're, we're, we're living in a, in a, in a quasi-fascist situation right now. It would I mean, there's, there's too many industrialists that have bought their way into the political mm -hmm. establishment and have, yeah. the, and have, have the favors, uh, have the, have the uh, playing field in their favor. They're always buying advantages in right. Congress. And, uh, you know, it's, it's all moving that way. And, you know, once Biden was elected, you watched the big tech companies, mm -hmm. they all turned and, and other... Companies are all doing, all doing the government's bidding, right. and, uh, which the media has been doing for uh, decades. Right. Now. So when you get into office, you're going to uh, have the following experience. Uh, your assistant will have the calendar, and uh, at 10 o'clock, it'll be uh, Mr. Jones will be coming in. And he sits down, and you're looking at him, and you realize that he's a lot richer than you. Yeah. Okay, so you have the power, he has the money. I'm sure you guys can work something out. Yeah, right. <laughs> that's all okay. they do down there. Uh, that's exactly. You know, people, but, you know, I mean, politics attracts reptiles. I mean, you know, people always ask me, how come there aren't better people in politics? Because it attracts reptiles. They, they, you know, they're all in and, and, and they're, 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 they're very greedy and, and self-centered and all the rest and mm -hmm. like power, you know, I don't know. Well, they, I, people grow up, they, they want to make other people do things, you know, yeah, well, <laughs> do I'm, their bidding. You know? I'm still holding been, out for the belief that there are some who are legitimately public servants. Yeah. Okay. We, so we've seen, we've seen some. Otherwise. You know. we, we've seen some. Rudy Giuliani is, is, is a good example. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. he's just, you know, everybody has their flaws. There's been a lot of criticism of him and stuff. Mm -hmm. But that guy went into New York. He did the right thing. He straightened that place mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's a few like that. Reagan was great. I mean, what, you know, it, it just attracts these people. And mm -hmm. if you look at them in Congress and you, I just can't believe some of these people are authority sure. over anything. And it's what they get away with. I mean, this is what we are constantly complaining about. Meantime, let me pick up on another subject you have in the book here, having more to do with uh, the climate hoax. Okay. Um, how do I want to start this? We've had the environmentalist movement in this country for quite some time now, at least since the 70s. Yep. And on page 43, by the way, folks, if there was no other reason to buy this book, page 43, <laughs> okay, you put together this excellent point-by-point -point summary of what defines, you know what I'm talking about, right? Point-by-point. I, mean, point, I haven't read page 43 in a while. Go ahead. Okay, but point-by-point. Point, Fire away. Um, showing how environmentalism is like a religion. Oh, yeah, the gay worship. Right? Yeah. A transcendent God, nature, a personification of divinity, Gaia, a devil, capitalism, a mass of devoted a devotee, cult followers, immune to counter-argument, a large corpus of literature. It goes on, you know, yeah. and it's just... Tony it's, wrote that page. Oh, he did. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Good for he you, wrote Tony. That one out. Good for you. 
Yeah. Well, I mean. So yes, it's just. It, it it, yeah. It's another thing that's been created and exploited. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a conservationist. And I, I, so most 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 people in our generation are conservationists. We grew yes. up in there. Things were thrown right. out the windows of cars all. Over. <laughs> it was awful, and, and and that's all calmed down. I and mean, most of us try to you know, act interface with the environment and our surroundings with a minimal amount of, of waste and, and all, and all yeah. the rest. But the idea of, of man-made climate change, it, it, it's just being exploited. It's a wealth transfer mm -hmm. rubric to transfer wealth from the middle uh, income class in mm -hmm. America to the economic underclass both here and elsewhere in the world. Right, but That's all also, it is. Just tell me, you know. To just, also hammer individual liberties as yeah, well. Just tell me how much I have to write the check for to make you happy. Yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's a fabulous umbrella concept to get into everything. Mm -hmm. And they're doing it. Now they're, exactly you know, right. your gas stove and your cars and all, there's nothing that the climate, mm -hmm. that, now they have racist bridges, racist highways and well, stuff. That's a whole other, yeah, that's a different Yeah, you know, subject. but it's all, it's all part of the, it's all part of that whole, that whole thing. And th there's an answer for everything and they, and, and they control it. I, what I say is anybody out there, bring mm -hmm. up onto your screen uh, a serious scientific study on on any aspect of climate change mm -hmm. and if they allow comments below you'll have a blast because you will watch <laughs> phds below it rip each other's throats out from either side mm -hmm. this is the furthest thing from settled science that yeah. you can imagine it is not settled mm -hmm. we yeah. don't know if the climate is going through an, a, any kind of unusual change in the in, in in the historical wave and even further away from that if it is we don't know if man has anything to do about it all we do know is mm -hmm. that it's being exploited to control our lives it's not it's not being exploited to free us yes yeah, so i would add to that it's not just um it's the denigration of the individual sure the denigration well, but they love the that. individual they love they hate the individual okay. Right. And so this is this is being used you know, in that I, manner. Yeah. Although, yes, on but on the other hand, you'll have a discussion that says, Yes, you too can be a good steward of the environment. Just do these things and don't do those things. Yes. Well, and, and your phone will tell you and then your phone will keep you from getting on a bus or a plane yeah. because you got you don't have enough carbon credits. Like I say to mm -hmm. some of them, I say, Okay, I'll play along with your game. We all get one house, one car. And there's no such thing as trading carbon credits. Let's go. Open, op yeah, <laughs> open the field day, guys. See how long that yeah, lasts. Me, Bill Gates, and right. Griffin, and Buffett, and the rest, rest of them. Let's all play by those mm -hmm. rules. One house, one car. Because what they were setting up in 2009, mm -hmm. which we did stop in Obama's first year, was uh, cap and trade. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and we were on the streets fighting that with the Tea Party, and we won that. Mm -hmm. Because... They had already, Goldman Sachs and others had already built trading floors to trade carbon credits. All right. Yes. Are you ready for another weird that, one? That went there down. was this guy. I, he was um, GAO. I wish I could. Lawrence Rains. That was his name, Lawrence Rains. And he had been awarded a patent for carbon trading. Yeah. That was given to, uh, I want to say, Fannie Mae. How does Fannie Mae get a patent for carbon trading? I don't know. They needed an entity. This is bizarre. Yeah, they, they really thought that was coming. It was August 1st. Yes, there you go. It was, or, right. It, was, it was right at the break, and Pelosi was saying that they were going to take that up on the other side, mm -hmm. ahead of Obamacare. They didn't quite have it formed yet, mm -hmm. but they were going to do cap and trade, and that's when the town halls erupted and everything else, and man, they... They deep six that, but they almost had cap and trade. Yes, I can think of someone who was particularly disappointed. Yeah, that would be Mr. Himes. <laughs> yeah, he sure was. But right. uh, they were all yeah, they were all set up to do that. I mean, it is preposterous to think you can go in a building in Washington and write legislation on a, a piece of paper that is going to change the ambient temperature of the globe. Mm -hmm. Sure. Regardless of what. 
two and a half billion Chinese and Indians yeah, have I to say another, about it. The, the, this, it's, this, that's preposterous. And and somebody like Himes will stand there and 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 contend that. Okay, I got another one. It's ridiculous. For, I got another one. It's the same hubris. It's the same mind-bendingly stupid arrogance. Okay, Connecticut had passed a law many years ago when there was a concern over um, invasive plants, and uh, one was uh, kudzu from the south. Oh yeah. Okay, so. State of Connecticut passed a law prohibiting the importation of kudzu. Guys, it's too late. Yes. Yeah. Too late. Well. Here you have an aggressive growing plant already in our borders, and now you're going to pass a law to uh, restrict it coming into the state. Are you serious? You have I-95 and these other people. All this commerce passes. Yeah, one state isn't going wow. to be able to do that. Yeah, that's just amazing. Anyway, there was this other thing we were talking about that um, this is actually pretty serious. We just started to talk about it. Hey, this is all serious, Court. Come on. Oh, the, this, okay, you know, <laughs> I guess maybe I'm overreacting to the concept of violence. Gee, I don't know. So I'll just read it. So page 268, and it's the battle terrain ahead. So you go through a number of items of concern. And uh, you said here, expect Antifa and BLM members to disperse to form local advocacy groups in heavily Democrat areas where they will function as local militias. Well, didn't we see a, um, an early demonstration of that? A few years ago, when you had uh, what was it called, Chaz? Yeah, well, yeah. And remember the, the was, summer of 2020 was a, it was one or two kids who got shot by these guys who were acting as a so-called militia in this yeah quickly formed yeah yeah they did, they did that to the journalist out there Ning right uh, what's his name I forget his first name but they they beat him up yeah and so listen they, they need muscle on the street. And Antifa has been uh, exactly that, and mm -hmm. it, it's it's a very dangerous mix. Look, okay, we, we we saw their act at the world. We used to see oh, it over the wait, decades oh, at the I'm World sorry. Trade Organization. Oh, I'm, wait, oh, I'm sorry, I left something out here, yeah. <laughs> or maybe you did. <laughs> I said Antifa and BLM members. I forgot illegal aliens. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because there's already talk, ladies and gentlemen. If you haven't read the article yet, that illegals are joining up with Antifa and BLM down in Texas to, show us say, pull a little more muscle into those protests. Yeah, yeah. So expect it to it, spread. It'll explode, you know. I, I mean, look how fast 2020 exploded, you know. Oh, mm -hmm. you know it, they were just looking, looking for an incident. Mm -hmm. That's what they do because, yeah. you know, th that, that incident, George Floyd was, in, you know, bad policing. Mm -hmm. he, if, but if they said the whole thing, he was, he was, he used to say, I can't breathe when he was inside the, the police car and he yeah. has to be put outside and on, on the ground. Now, whatever the merits of that, bad policing, but, but that's all they wanted was mm -hmm. an incident, right? And so then all of a sudden it's springing up all over the country. Yeah. Then they got their hand out. Yep. Well, they collected a couple hundred million dollars from corporations you got to give to BLM. They said... You know, I told my pastor, I said, you know, he's buying into this. And I said, why don't you look at the website? They're Marxists. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were self-described self Marxists on their website until they took it off. But it was, mm -hmm. yeah, Patrice Coulars. I mean, these, these yes. people, they're all subversives. And they took the yeah, money and ran. They took the money. They built a few mansions. God knows where they well, are they now. They bought them. They didn't they're build being, them. They're being, they're being protected someplace now. I don't, I don't yeah. know where the heck they are. But this, this, you know, that was the, the same people from Occupy Wall Street go to the BLM, and, and, and the Antifa runs through the whole thing. They're, they're, they've been there before, and they'll be there after. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very dangerous because of all the illegals coming through uh, the border, and, you know, they, if they start teaming up with this, watch out. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll, there'll be street stuff everywhere, yeah. and, and we won't be able to put, so put it down. I, I don't know how it gets nipped in the bud. Yeah. I do not know. Well, the bud is passed. You know, it's mm -hmm. how do we how do we turn this mm -hmm. thing? But okay. the one that's guaranteed to to tick this off is is financial because that's that's dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. That's math. It's like gears. It'll get to a point. And and there are some s people that have called the shots going along here as to what was happening. and Think it it could be in the in this in the spring mm -hmm. of twenty four because the repo market 
where they draw the funds from to buy the bond. The Fed isn't supposed to be doing well, this. My understanding of the repo market is that banks help balance each other out with these overnight Yeah, loans. but there's a big pot in there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and they, they, they take from that. And other places, and they mm. buy the they buy the bonds off the market so that the interest rate go, doesn't well, go too high. What you're describing almost sounds like an abuse of the system. Well, it is. It is. That's how they artificially keep the interest rates down. The Fed surreptitiously goes in the market mm -hmm. and buys it. When you're issuing debt through the Federal Treasury here, and you got a Federal Reserve over here buying it off on the side. Yeah. I mean that's subterfuge, and that's what that's what has kept the interest rates low since 08. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, in order to sell that debt, they would have, there'd be fewer buyers out there and they'd have to keep raising the interest rate. Anybody buying at 2%? No, 3 no, 4 All right, at 4 and it starts to buy, and then you sell it up at, the last one goes at 10 okay, but, they, but if you have the Fed on the side buying it off, the okay. pressure is never on the seller. Yeah. And that's what they do. It's a, it's a, it's a, the Treasury auctions it, and the Fed makes sure okay, they buy so there it. Hasn't, lately, there hasn't been much discussion of this, but is the Fed still uh, monetizing the debt? Yeah. They're still doing it. Now it's $2 trillion a year. That's what they're screaming about down there, because they, they, they wanted to go back. The Republicans want to go back to the spending levels pre-COVID. And Democrats, once they get anything on the books, they ain't going back on anything. Mm -hmm. So now the, the deficit is $2 trillion, roughly. We, we take in $5 trillion in taxes and we're spending 7 And they have no plans in changing the trajectory of that. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from three or four or five hundred billion deficits, which add to the debt each year, to $2 trillion. Every, Whatever the national deficit is, that number gets added to the debt at the end of the year. So the question is, what makes this all crack? What With the credit market, they, they freeze up. Well, interest rates spike. If you get up okay. some more, interest rates on the 10-year note are, are touching 5% right now. Okay, yep. And, and they were down at 2.5% in the spring. Yep. So they, they've like right. doubled. They've moved right. fast. Well, that didn't and, they go with the Fed fund rate? Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean the, the fact the Fed, that the Fed kept raising... Well, yeah, the, the, the Fed's raise in federal fund rate, that's the rate which the banks borrow from each other. But there's a free market out there, and mm -hmm. the notes are sold supposedly into the free market. Yeah. And now it's touching 5%. Now, they used to have control over this, and when it would break three, the Fed would come in and do a lot of buying, and it would drop the rate down. But in, in the early summer, it broke through three, and, it, and then it got toward four. They can't buy enough. And that's the thing. Oh, so when it gets oh, to the point where they okay, can't buy wow, enough to wow. let the steam off. So you're telling me that we're on the verge of losing control. Yeah. That's where we are yeah, right now. Yeah. Now, admittedly, I've been telling wow. people that, and, and I wouldn't have put a good date on it, but over the last 10 years, that's the game. And I said, this thing's going to blow, but they keep okay. finding new ways of financing it. But now that it's broken through and it's touching five on the 10-year, well, Santilli came on. You know what he said? Three Recently, years from now? He said something about three years from now? Yeah. Yeah. What? 17%. Yeah. Yeah. I used to have a money market account that made 17%. Yeah, 1981. Yeah. 1980, 81. Yeah. So he's saying, here we go again. Yeah. Oh, There's brother. no reason it won't go. If it gets stopped what? around that range, we're okay. We can manage. This thing could go to 80% interest rates. It could go to anything. Well, now you start look. I mean, there have been cases, right? I mean, if you look at like Venezuela and other, quote, third world countries, there have been time, Zimbabwe, right? Yeah, they think so it they, can't happen. They think it can't happen. It doesn't yeah. have to go that way. But they're going to yeah. bust this thing. Right now, people, you know, the housing market is, is stalled because mm -hmm. of the interest rates. The commer yeah. commercial, uh, uh, commercial real estate market, mm -hmm. it's a mess because people are working at right. home, mm -hmm. which is contributing to it. But look at these interest rates. Interest rates drive everything. Most people don't realize most businesses run on debt. Yes, understood. Yeah. It's if they were a good business, yeah. If somebody said time out, they could square things away. But, okay, but a they got long-term investments, so they're buying, they get okay, short but, money to do short okay, things. Okay, but it's still true. Long-term to short-term debt, if the ratio is more than three to one, you're toast. Yeah, well, you know, there's so many so, zombie companies out there, too. Okay, that, so... Now we are, we're at the one hour mark roughly here. Uh, so I just want to grab a couple of last things. So from the uh, last chapter, 
a signal call to millennials. You know, again, you just, in a nice tight summary, um, the ruling political class has squandered our trust, think COVID, betrayed the principles upon which this nation was founded, and with its actions, brought the country into our current crisis. Fair statement, fair yeah. statement, okay. <laughs> So that said, we move on to, I want to, I don't know if this is a way to end this, but okay, so you have, I'm just going to randomly grab some of your calls to action here. First of all, this is a little unfair. Criticize no one on the right. Well, this, we're, in the, we're in the fight. Yes. I mean, we, we got all this array, arrayed against us. Yes. Yeah, Certainly not publicly. Um, well, I mean, would, I mean, would you consider a rhino on the right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know. You, okay. you, you could debate so, that one. All right. Yes, we could. But listen, that's what we're up against. We're up mm -hmm. against a monolith coming at us. They mm -hmm. criticize no one on the left. So go ahead. Although that started to break down with Israel. Yeah. You know, yeah. their dream. Expose the leftists wherever you uncover them. Never trust the words of a rhino Republican. Right. Always support the rule of law and assert it against those who seek to overthrow it. Uh, so it goes on, but I would say if there's anything in terms of argumentation, the single point you make that's the most important is to always argue from fact. Absolutely. Right, right. That's, that's, that's what we do. Nobody wants to, nobody wants to address the facts. They mm -hmm. do all atmospherics. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's awful. Right. Everything's atmospherics, optics. Mm -hmm. you know, and they'll tell you. They'll, they'll tell you, you know, e even... Even Biden's allies over the last couple of days referenced he flew to Israel, you know, because of the optics of it. He needed to go do something, you know. It's yeah. like, right. You know, he flies over, he gets in the air, and then, and then the Egyptians and the Jordanians say, well, we're not going to meet with you. So he flies and shakes and then Yahoo's hand and comes back. So it's all optics. It's all performative. Mm -hmm. All this stuff is performative, mm -hmm. you know. Like, I don't know what acting school they went to, but years ago, no, no. Court, remember years ago, some politician get caught with something, they well, basically fold their tent off and leave the stage. Clinton said, no way, we can just stay on the stage and the news cycle will pass us by. And he's absolutely correct. He got away with all of that stuff mm -hmm. in the 90s. And they all do it now. Nobody mm -hmm. leaves. Menendez, he won't resign. <laughs> gets yeah. caught with all this stuff in his house. Yes. Ridiculous. Uh, Second yeah. time around. Yeah. Anyway, I see we're kind of at the one hour mark here. All right. And so it's called Thank You. Oh. Well, thank you. Seventhcrisis.com. Right. All here. spelled out. Right. There you go. <laughs> Seventhcrisis.com spelled out. That's um, great. And, you know, just to remind you, I don't read books, I read books with a pen in my hand. Yeah. And uh, so do I. And I didn't uh, waste any time making some things in here. But I'll save that for another time. No, I right, appreciate thank you. you having me.